This episode is brought to you by the Cloth Filter Company, who hand sew reusable coffee filters for all your favorite pour over and batch brew devices. Save trees, save money, make delicious coffee. I use them almost every day, so check the show notes for details. Welcome back to the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward, friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and we are in episode two of our five part series with Muki Young. And Muki, you are based in Kenya. We are talking about Kenyan coffee. Uh, as a, a value chain and there are a lot of perceptions out there whether they're correct or incorrect about the way that the Kenyan coffee value chain works uh, people have opinions about Kenyan coffee people have a whole bunch of things that they think is the right understanding of the way that the Kenyan coffee value chain works you're on the ground there you've been on the ground there for a few years now Help us set the the stage of it. Help us set the record of like what your perception is and your your lived experiences of the Ke- Kenyan coffee value chain. Okay, so I think sometimes uh, us as buyers in other countries, as consumers, mm-hmm. origin can be very very confusing. And um. For some, maybe you think that it's untraceable, it's very uh, corrupt perhaps, uh, it's really difficult to understand exactly how, what is going on, where your coffee is from. Now being in Kenya so long, especially my experience uh, working with other origins, uh, not just being in Brazil, but as an importer, uh, moving coffees from different places around the world. I would quite confidently say that the system in Kenya is quite traceable. Of course, there can always be improvements made, and I think we will continue to to do better. Mm-hmm. But the system can be, if you purchase a coffee in Kenya, you should be able to trace it back down to even a smallholder supplying into a coffee right. level. So if we begin right at the beginning, you would have a producer. They would either be a small holder or they would be uh, an estate owner. Mm-hmm. So you separate, separate it, uh, it like that. At the small holder level, you could have as few as 100 trees. It could mm-hmm. maybe be half an acre of coffee. Maybe you have an acre of coffee. And often at that level, they're almost subsistence farming. Like mm-hmm. They have the trees, they're, they're, there's a level of seriousness into it, but they're probably also doing other things. Mm-hmm. There might be macadamia, there might grow beans, uh, maybe not to sell, but coffee, coffee, sometimes tea also would be their main source of cash, so it would be their cash crop. Mm-hmm. Um, because they are so small, they won't be able to mill or process the coffee themselves. This, is, this isn't always the case in surrounding countries, so countries like Ethiopia, Maybe Rwanda, maybe Tanzania. If they have enough space, they will process a bit of the coffee themselves. Usually, it's mm-hmm. natural. That is not the case in Kenya. Almost always, several thousand people of uh, several thousand smallholders will work together as part of a cooperative, uh, where they would have joined as a member, put in some money mm-hmm. to purchase a shared mill. Uh, to hire uh, staff for the mill and then they would process their coffee together and combined they can produce hundreds of thousands of kilos of cherry versus they themselves maybe only putting in several hundred kilos as as a single person so they they share uh, the, the burden of the cost that way. Um, but for some buyers, that can be confusing because you have so many people delivering coffee in that, is, that it feels like it is impossible to separate a single farmer from, from the bulk. Mm. Uh, I do agree that, yes, you will not be able to get a single farm lot from that level. It just doesn't work that way. But in mm-hmm. many respects, that system works amazingly um, very much so in Kenya that cooperative coffees are some of the best quality coffees that you can get mm-hmm. in, in Kenya still um, 
there are the system can have its faults. Um, I think it can always be better managed. Uh, the cooperative level, at the cooperative level, uh, prices paid to a farmer twenty percent generally will go back to the cooperative to cover costs. Um, it can always be a bit hazy because maybe you don't need that twenty percent, <laughs> but you know, it's it's a a well-managed cooperative. The people who are working with that cooperative will be happy to stay. That farmer doesn't have to work with that cooperative. If they're in a catchment area that they can take their coffee to somewhere else because that cooperative is ripping them off or maybe they're not processing the coffee as well as they should um, or maybe they don't like the management, whatever it is there it is possible for them to go to another property. Maybe the one up the road offers a better price per kilo of cherry than this one. That's a little bit closer. So they do have choice there. And that is what I like about this system. You're not, you are never locked in to having to, having to work with just one person, one group or uh, uh, one service provider. You have the freedom of choice in this method to work with whoever is going to give you the best option. Um, so that's the cooperative level. Mm -hmm. Moving on from there, we have estates of various sizes. You could have uh, a small estate. It's, it's, it's small by, Ken it, it's a large by Kenyan standards, I should say. Could be five, could be two hectares of coffee, as long as they have enough that they can produce um, enough coffee to mill themselves and they would have invested in their own drying beds, uh, conditioning bins, their own uh, pulper, and they would have a little bit of skill in processing the coffee themselves. Mm -hmm. From there, you have larger estates, not always owned and managed by one farm owner. Sometimes it's owned by a group. Um, just like you would have in countries like Australia where it's not to say that you're dealing with a farmer who can be managed by a large group. Like um, a dairy. Investing. Yeah. yeah, like so a dairy So they might situation. be investing in coffee. Um, and from, so they, that would be the producers, number one, on that side. Mm -hmm. The second step there is what we call marketing agents. To say that to a buyer in a country like Australia could be confusing because when we think marketing, we think something else. But really, if we... Simplify it just means there are people who bring the coffee to market. Okay. Um, so they represent uh, the, the producers. Mm -hmm. They often provide services to the producers, whether mm -hmm. that is training. Uh, sometimes they will sell inputs, fertilizers, sprays, provide assistance on how to use them as well. Um, because for a small farmer in the middle of nowhere, to, to have the right information to be able to source these things can be quite difficult. Mm -hmm. But if you're working with a company that is able to buy this in bulk and then have field officers to come to, to deliver it to you, to show you how to use it, um, that can be of benefit to, to them. Uh, they will also assist in certifying estates or cooperatives if, if needed. And that is a very, very complex uh complex thing to to have to go through uh and it, it is much easier for for the marketing agent to do it than than a property to try to do this themselves um, quick question when you say yep. certify you don't mean fair trade or any of those kinds of things you mean certify for the sea market no no this is uh rfa fair trade maybe okay that is that kind of certification yeah we're not talking yeah. about for the commercial market. No, no, no. That's just a general certification. Okay. Um, yep. And from and then they also take the coffee to market. Uh, so they are the ones responsible for selling direct to a to to an exporter or to take it to the Nairobi coffee, the Nairobi coffee exchange. Mm -hmm. The marketer usually has some kind of association with a mill. So mm -hmm. whether they own a, a dry mill or they, 
work together with third party mill. So there's there's some connection to to at least one. Um, in in my case, the company that I work for, we have uh, two to three marketing agents, and we have three mills in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, from uh, from the marketing agent and the mill, we move to the exporter, which is myself at that point. And I am responsible for uh, finding a buyer for for this coffee. So one mm-hmm. first step is identifying uh, what is quality coffee, what type of quality it is. So whether I want to move something as specialty, as micro lot, uh, maybe I think it's more suitable for a blender, maybe it's commercial. And then we work from that point which Mm -hmm. market is is suitable for Um, another big part of my role is being the conduit for many relationship coffees that we have um, between the buyer and the producer and I don't think people realize how much work is involved in doing this that even if you have a buyer and a and a and a producer that they are able to talk they're able to talk at any point we we encourage it um you can reach out to people directly on whatsapp i if people ask i never hide it i i always want people to do this but it still helps to be if if you are an exporter or if you're working at that level to be as involved as you can to see people Mm. face to face um i visit farms whenever i can to connect with uh, to, to just be on the ground to see what's happening, to see if there's mm-hmm. any problems, um, any anything we can help them with, and then being able to pass on that information to to the end buyer or vice versa. Um, and then from that point, we move into shipment and uh, importer, uh, roaster, buyer, consumer, etc. Now, yeah. people would undoubtedly be looking at the uh you know the thumbnail for this episode the the image they'd be looking at the video if they if they are watching it on youtube or if they're listening to it through their their podcast listening apps they will come to realize that uh uh, when they do look at the image that's the promo for this episode they realize that you are not a kenyan local no you you are not kenyan uh, and they will be thinking, well, here we have someone who's not Kenyan talking for Kenya. And recently, uh, I don't even remember how recently, there was an article that was released by a white guy talking about his opinions about Kenyan coffee. And uh, there are a lot of opinions out there and people talking about Kenyan coffee uh and people will be wondering, like, if Lee wants to talk about Kenyan coffee, why isn't she getting a Kenyan uh, local on the podcast? Just to, to clear up anyone that might be thinking about that, I have tried. Uh, I contact people who are Kenyan coffee producers and they are very gracious about the fact that they have been invited. But uh, my experience is that they tend to be shyer uh, about coming on the podcast and don't want to say no but don't want to say yes either um there is muki a real kind of distaste right now for uh people speaking on behalf of producers when they're not from the same uh uh culture Mm -hmm. as as that producer um I say all of that so that we can just set the record straight about like why Muki is talking about Kenyan coffee. I have a relationship with Muki. Uh, We've been in the same industry for a long time. Uh, We came from the same, we're both from the Sydney coffee uh, industry and I trust Muki to talk openly and with integrity about what she's experienced in Kenya. Um, Additionally, I trust Muki to represent what she has experienced in Kenya and Kenyan coffee producers authentically. Uh, so for anyone who has been thinking, why is this the way that a, co- a conversation about Kenya is going down? This is why it's going down that, this way. Uh, and 
any Kenyan coffee producers who do listen to this podcast, and I know that there are producers in Kenya that listen to this podcast because they contact me and they tell me thank you for the podcast, but they won't come on the podcast. If at any time you change your opinion, please let me know. You can contact Muki and Muki will put you in contact with me um, or just reach out to me. I'm kind of everywhere and would love to have you. But Muki, I need you to set the record straight about something as well. The quality of Kenyan coffee. The article that we spoke about really shit canned Kenyan coffee and put mm-hmm. into question um, the integrity of Kenya as a value chain and Kenyan coffee. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? So I feel like if we have anything to go by to seeing how this past year went, uh, which the this uh, article was was uh, written prior to, um, in a way we don't have anything to worry about. I, I have very dedicated buyers from all over the world who still mm-hmm. love Kenyan coffee. We've had the biggest and best year that we've had in a very, very long time, not only in terms of production, but quality and prices paid um, on average. So it, it's just been crazy to, to have not only had a significantly bigger year, but to get to the point where I can say that we, we almost don't have anything to trade anymore. So wow. Coming from a country like Brazil, where we, you know, 55 plus million bags, various changes, mm-hmm. any, any small dip is still is still bigger than our overall production in Kenya. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I go by demand, I don't have anything to worry about. I do hear people say that Kenyan coffee is changing, as in the, the cup profile is changing. It doesn't mm-hmm. taste the way that it used to. I will argue that I do. while I do agree, I don't think that affects quality. I'm Even if it doesn't taste of those blackberry, uh, black currant apple kind of juice, uh, juice, juicy plum bombs that we we're accustomed mm-hmm. to in the past, um, I'm still getting coffees that taste, that, sorry, that, that cup 88 up, but it's just a different profile. Uh, maybe it's a bit harder to find those, what, what we had associated as fantastic quality Kenyans, uh, but they're still there. Mm-hmm. I think what, what happened was we had a big shift. Uh, this is my theory anyway, with quite a large shift in the past couple of years, the introduction of River 11, which is, a, which is a varietal that was created by the Coffee Research Institute of Kenya mm-hmm. as being a bit more uh, tolerant. Um, it required less input. So on that level, for farmers, this was a fantastic variety to be planting. And it was starting to replace SL, SL 28 and 34. Mm-hmm. That was the the common variety that Kenya was really well known for. I do believe that SL was very responsible for Kenya flavor. Mm -hmm. What is interesting though is that many other countries have tried to take SL, just like countries tried to take uh, Geisha and Mm -hmm. certain other varieties, and They've never been able to match the what origin. We've put out. Yeah. Yeah. There's just something inherently well, the Torah, wonderful right? about it's it's meant to be. It's meant to be. Like you I think it you, we can look at other food, other beverages, uh, other plants around the world that we try to take and grow somewhere else. Yeah. But there are just things that we can't I mean, we, we can't do better than nature, and this this is one right. of those things. Well, the terroir so, of a of a of a place is as much as what you're tasting, and and contributes to the end product yeah. as the plant and and the genetics of that plant itself, right? Yeah. And that little, so so the the coffee zones of Kenya are wider than people realize. That 
there's that main spot that people adore between Mount Kenya and the Aberdare mountain range in between mm-hmm. Nairobi and, and Mount Kenya. And it's just magic. Mm. The coffees that come out of there taste of nowhere else. And uh, but specifically SL, uh, coffees that were, uh, that were from SL varieties. But over time, we've seen an increase of River 11, and understandably so, because to a farmer, that is what overall will maybe make them more money or at least cost them less to produce. Um, and we've seen a little bit of a shift. So if I have to put that in very simple terms, it's like, a farmer that has been growing navel oranges their whole life. Mm-hmm. And people really love that flavor, that, that orange juice. They really love that flavor of orange juice. It's what they've been familiar with. And then suddenly it started to get a bit more expensive to grow this. The trees are suffering a little bit. Um, they were attacked by some kind of blight and they were still producing good quality, but it was less or it was harder. And then suddenly this research institute develops Blood oranges, it's meant Mm -hmm. to be easier to grow. Uh, It produces more. You don't need to add as many inputs. You don't have to look after it as much. Still an orange, but it doesn't taste the same. But it's not. It could still be less sweet, but it doesn't taste the same. Yeah. And it's it's a bit like that. Uh, I have, over time, I think people, uh, some buyers appreciate that kind of Kenya for what it is. But there has been pressure to to try to find that classic Kenya mm-hmm. that people are familiar with. And then I understand. I think we might see, well, I've definitely seen a little bit more of a shift to farmers uh, replanting more or so because there can be a premium mm-hmm. associated with that. Uh, buyers are willing to pay a bit more if, if, if they can have a cell coffees and coffees that taste of that. I don't think Kenyan coffee is worse than what it was when I first first entered coffee and understood what it was. I still cup amazing qualities every year. Like I don't think there's many places in the world where you can cup 100 coffees and have the majority of them cupping over 86, 87 points. And uh, I get that in Kenya. And, and f- it's we're very, folks- very lucky. For those of you who are out there thinking, well, but Muki works in Kenya. She has to say this about Kenya. Again, I want to reiterate what I said before. I trust Muki. Muki is a straight shooter and she talks straight. Like Muki's not here just saying what she thinks you need to hear. Muki's Muki's the real deal. So, uh yeah, I really believe that, Muki, and I've always, all of my interactions with you, for the, the whole amount of time that I've seen you, you have always been a straight shooter, which is why I wanted to have this conversation with you. So your, re- your last comments do set us up fantastically for the next episode. And in the next episode, we're going to talk about what uh, what is going on with Kenyan coffee from a market perspective today after the last three years that we've had uh, and heading into some very interesting times for the globe. Uh, it's important for us to understand uh, what, how Kenyan coffee is going to be set up given uh, you're talking about how many extraordinary coffees you're cupping and scoring really high. How is, given the industry on the consuming end is experiencing extraordinary pressure. How will that have a flow on effect to Kenyan as an origin? So let's let's do that now. We'll have that conversation. Peace of and peanut butter, everybody. Have an amazing rest of your day. Thanks, friends. If you enjoyed this video, here's what you should check out next. Consider supporting Mapper Forward on Patreon and be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell before you leave.